Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at JFN, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you all to today's program, State of Play, Professional Talent in the Jewish Nonprofit Sector. Today, we will learn about how COVID-19 has affected leaders and professionals in our community and what it means for the future of the Jewish nonprofit sector. Our speakers will share research about employee experiences and organizational policy changes during the pandemic and how this, is, how this has affected the field in order to help us understand how we might be able to support and maximize the potential of the Jewish communal workforce at this time. If you have questions during the presentations, presentations, please write them in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and we will try to get to as many of them as we can towards the end of our time together. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Amy Bourne, the Chief Strategy Officer at Leading Edge to further frame today's program and introduce her fellow panelists. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. It's great to be with you all today. Um, just as we're getting started and getting to know each other, I'd love to start with one prompt to have you write in the chat. Um, today is the day of uh, the first day of October, I believe, and also the, uh, we've just entered a new Jewish year. So I'm curious, um, in just a few words, what's one thing you're bringing with you into October? And you can just write that in the chat just to start to see who, who's on and, and what's one thing you're bringing with you into the new month and the new year. And then I'll get started. Um, so like Tamar said, my name's Amy Bourne. I have the, I proudly work for Leading Edge uh, and have for the past four years. My background is in organizational psychology and I've spent time both in the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector working with organizations. Um, and certainly um, a lot of what has happened over the past six months has dramatically impacted the way people experience life and the way people experience work. So it is a tremendously fascinating um, and tumultuous time in the field of organizational psychology and what work really looks like. Um, here's what we're going to do during our time together. So first you're going to hear from me. I'm going to share some data from the field and some trends that we're seeing. I will try to make it as interesting as possible because data can be hit or miss. Um, and uh, these slides will be shared with you after the fact. So if there's any points of data that you don't quite catch, you'll be able to see them afterward. Um, when I'm done, um, Corinne will speak. Corinne is the Director of HR at American Jewish World Service, and she'll tell you about the people-centered approach that they're using and centering their work around um, as they have done tremendous things during this time. And then we'll hear from Randall Kaplan, who is a business leader, a uh, funder, and a board member of Leading Edge and many other boards. So happy to have you both here. Um, I'm going to start with, with a he, a, some data and I want to tell you where it came from. Um, so Leading Edge for the past four years has offered a large employee experience survey to the Jewish nonprofit sector. Uh, and this year we did something different given that that didn't feel appropriate. So we, did, uh, we offered organizations the opportunity to participate in a pulse survey and they can do it whenever makes sense for them and as many times as makes sense for them. Um, and so far, we've had at least 100 organizations participate. Um, we also had a survey that we asked organizations about the ways that they've been approaching policies uh, at their organizations based on changes that they may have made. And that survey, this policy survey, went to what I like to call the people people, like the people who focus on the people at organizations. Um, many of them filled it out. Um, so we have about 95 organizations represented in that data set. The data only gets more interesting from here, I promise. Um, so here, I'm gonna share three key trends that we found in the data, mostly from those pulse surveys and a little bit from the policy survey. So one thing we can feel good about at the moment is that people in our sector feel generally very cared for and supported. They feel like their managers are supporting them and reaching out to them. They feel like they have colleagues who they can trust, who they can turn to for support, and they feel that their organizations are prioritizing their physical health and well-being. Um, this data is from the past six months, and while these feelings of connection were very strong at the beginning, what I suspect is happening is some of the connection is starting to waver. Um, people have been in crisis mode now for over six months, 
it's, that's a lot of chronic stress for people to be experiencing. So it's something to keep our eyes on because it was a strength. So we know how to do it, but getting people to keep doing it may be hard. Um, we know because we work with a lot of CEOs and leaders that the, what we call in psychology, the allostatic load, like the fight and flight experience that they have had is not sustainable and leaders are feeling very worn out. We also know that work is being asked to be very different than what it was before. Before it was a thing someone did during their day. Now it is often the thing that someone does. It is the connection that they have to, the, to other people in the world. It gives them purpose and meaning and it, um, it gives them routine that they don't have otherwise. So work is being asked to do a lot of things. Leaders are being asked to do a lot of things. And while we have these great supportive connections, um, because of all these pressures, they may start to fade, fade a bit. Um, so great news that people are feeling supported and cared for. Um, the next piece of data is that people are generally feeling overwhelmed. Um, there only 65% of people believe their workload feels manageable. Um, mental health is a big challenge that will come up um, on and off throughout this conversation. Um, a lot of organizations have had to shift people's roles, uh, which in many cases is wonderful. They're finding ways to use people in, in different ways and maximize people's talents. Um, but also that's, that's hard. It's new for people. So people have new responsibilities and new roles that they have to learn quickly and during this time. So people are feeling overwhelmed. Um, I wanna mention this Zoom fatigue. When we talk about overwhelm, a lot of people talk that use the word Zoom fatigue and talk about that. That is absolutely real. There's a lot of things going on in the brain um, that make Zoom fatigue real for many of us. And um, I, I believe it's Zoom fatigue plus everything that's going on in the world around people um, makes it very hard for you to focus on Zoom and stay just staring at the screen all day when you're seeing things pop up in the news and things pop up in your own feeds and things like that. So I think it's Zoom fatigue um, plus the challenge of staying focused at work and the challenge of rising above and, and seeming very professional during a time that can feel hard for people. And as uh, no surprise to anyone there is um, more uncertainty ahead. Um, people were feeling this before and they're feeling it, they continue to feel it now. Um, there, for a while, this first data point, I just wanna to speak to for a moment. It's about whether or not people feel that they're involved in decisions that impact and affect their work. I would say that 64% of people feeling that way is actually okay for the first four-ish months of this time period. Because when leaders are in this directive leadership emergency crisis mode, sometimes people aren't able to weigh in on all the decisions that are made about their work. Um, however, the, th that is something to keep an eye on because if people feel disengaged or disconnected from decisions that are impacting them for, for a long time, that, that will feel disempowering. Um, the layoffs and furloughs is certainly something I know Randall will touch on also, but our, our sector is feeling it. Different parts of the Jewish nonprofit sector are feeling it more, um, but there continues to be uncertainty and people trying to do their jobs and not knowing if they will have one the next day. Um, I don't think any of this is going to blow your minds, but some, some of the impact of of the data and the experience that people are having. Um, leaders and managers are having to learn how to lead and manage very different, differently than they have before. So their energy, while still focused on mission and achieving their goals, is also on having to learn to be compassionate in a different way for many leaders, um, how to think differently about how to work with their people and get what they need done from people who are in a very different place than they were before. Um, I think the, the increased focus on mental health and wellness is just at its beginning. Um, it's not a short-term challenge that we're facing here in this country. I believe that mental health and wellness will be a huge um, 
uh, topic that workplaces have to confront in a different way than we have in the past. Um, also, we've all had to make decisions with a lack of information and that uncertainty and ambiguity can be really hard for people. I, I think there was a collective sigh of relief as organizations announced that they are not returning to the office, for example, until January at least. And that's one decision that leaders don't have a lot of information about, but it is something that provides people with comfort just to know what their future may look like and whether or not they are riding the subway or dealing with childcare and taking, taking their cars to work. Um, so make, leaders will continue to have to make decisions without all the information they want. Um, and a huge thing, the world of work really has changed. It probably was headed in the direction of more remote and more hybrid structure, but the accelerated um, speed at which we did that, uh, will, there will be some reeling around that. Um, and my dramatic statement at the bottom here <laughs> is that really if we don't invest in our people now, we might not have the right people to invest in in the future. People's experience at work and, and in the Jewish community at work is important. And if they don't feel cared for, um, and if they don't feel like they're able to have a purpose and have a mission, um, then I do worry that we may not have the right people to invest in um, as we move forward. Um, and just to draw some connections, some ways to support talent as, you're think as you may be thinking about um, different ways to fund and invest in organizations. Do you think the mental health and wellness piece is going to be huge? Um, and that's something that I'm doing a lot of research around at the moment, as many, many other people are also. Um, just thinking about how we can provide leaders with the support that they need. At Leading Edge, we have a cohort of CEOs that we work with. They're new, newish to their job. And we've provided wellness stipends to each of them so they could do something for themselves. Some of them have invested in physical exercise equipment or meditation apps or something to just take care of them for one moment. Um, uh, cultivate this culture and connection. So think about what is it that people need to stay connected to each other and stay really connected to their work. And also, are there ways we can reduce uncertainty and help people understand what's really expected of them? And how can we reduce, in some cases, what's really expected of them right now? Um, because there is there are tremendous um, weights pressing down on, on our leaders and on our people. Um, so on that note, I'm really excited to turn it over to Corinne from AJWS. Um, she has been an amazing colleague to me in the field and just showing, showing what this can look like when you, when you take a people-centered values-centered approach. Thank you, Amy. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm the director of HR at AJWS. I oversee all of our people and culture functions and I will say the themes that Amy shared resonate so deeply and capture so many of the challenges AJWS has faced this year. And um, a, a lot of the data really hits on approaches we've tried to take. Before I dive in, I'll share a little more about AJWS. Uh, we're a global human rights organization that's inspired by the Jewish commitment to justice. We work to realize human rights and poverty in the developing world. And we do so primarily through grant making to human rights partners in 19 different countries in the global south, as well as domestic advocacy here in the US. We have a global workforce of about 140. We're headquartered in New York, where we have about 90 people and the remaining 40 to 50 staff are spread throughout the US and across many of the countries that we work in. With a global pandemic of this scale, no community where we work or have staff has been left unaffected. Uh, the Director of Risk Management and I, in close collaboration with our President and CEO and our Executive Vice President, have really led our internal response. We've emphasized above all else the safety of our people and really wanting to take a people-centered approach to all decision making. We stopped all travel, canceled any group gatherings, including a board meeting that was also um, going to be taking our full board to Washington DC to do some advocacy work on the ground. Um, and we closed our offices before we were required to. As a result, we really saw very few cases of the virus among staff. And so even those early decisions really made an impact on our people. Um, we recognized that this was also a time when people would really need additional support. Amy, if you don't mind going to the next slide. 
So after closing our offices and going to a fully virtual environment, we realized we needed to ensure everyone could work remotely and that their basic needs were met with equipment and connectivity. We relied very heavily on Zoom and utilized some of their features we hadn't previously. But in addition to keeping people working, we also focused on keeping people connected. So we looked to both the existing structures we had, we created new structures, and we tried to find ways of providing individual support. So, you know, some of the existing structures are probably not very different than many organizations have in terms of one-to-one -one check ins divisional departmental meetings, and executive leadership level meetings. We started implementing virtual town halls, and we do those bi-monthly, and we've gotten great feedback about those. Um, we've been able to share, you know, one, to bring the community together. I think people have appreciated that. Uh, in the beginning, we would do breakouts within those because with, you know, 100 plus people on the screen, it's hard to connect. So we'd carve out time within those for smaller groups to connect. But we created that space to really share what are the decisions we have to make, what's going on in the organization, what's our financial status, uh, how long will we be working from home, and how can we best support our people. And we still continue to do those virtual town halls. Um, we created some Monday morning tips. A lot of those at first were really focused, as Amy noted, on health, mental health and wellness, and just general what's available to people. And we created some more informal gatherings. So we have a managers group for people managers that can come together to share challenges and, and help each other. And we have Tuesday and Thursday tea times. Um, and we kind of vary the, the timings we do these to really be able to allow everyone in our whole global workforce to participate. From an individual support perspective, uh, we really looked at work accommodations, flexibility, self-care and care for others. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, some of the federal leave opportunities have changed and tracking that, making sure people were clear about what was available to them in addition to what AJWS already offered. We did extend some of our leave policies if people needed it. Um, and as a result, we've really been able to retain people and work with them. Um, and in almost all cases, really keep people at full pay while taking leave too, which at this time is really essential when people's partners may have lost jobs or they're head of household now and uh, you know just all the demands that are now on the average person and um, and ensuring that was the case we developed a crisis response team that included the executive leadership as well as other key staff representing core business functions and so upon reflection i'd really describe this first four to six weeks as somewhat of a stabilization period it laid the groundwork for us to think more strategically about needs and take action. This foundation also supported us well as we shifted our focus on better supporting our Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the anti-racist and civil rights movements happening across the country and around the world. And having ways to connect and support each other and specifically our most more marginalized community members really continues to be incredibly important during this virtual way of working. You can go to the next slide. So after that initial phase, we started thinking about what are all the decisions we're making and how, what are they rolling up to? We created this guiding framework we call SANE. Um, um, is also a, obviously something we wanna maintain as our sanity. Um, and SANE is really support, act, navigate, and educate. So thinking about the practical supports we can offer, taking action proactively where possible, gathering data and navigating with a data-informed decision-making, and then really educating people, thinking about the external resources that are available to us that we need. Using this model, we have developed internal communication guidelines. Um, we realized that that became a seemingly small but a confusing thing for people. When do we use Zoom? When should we use email? Um, how should we be working with each other and what's the best way to do that? We updated policies. We specifically looked at leave and travel policies, for example. We clarified how long we'd work from home so people could plan their personal lives. At first, we said, we'll give ample notification. And then we realized, especially going into early summer, it was beneficial for people to know that they could leave the city and perhaps get out and, and be somewhere where there was more space than for a finite period of time. We've since extended that. Um, and said we will not open offices before January and we're assessing whether we'll stick with that deadline or push it out further. And if we do open, how to do so safely. Um, we offered everyone 
$500 to invest in their work from home spaces. Again, understanding most people didn't have really proper home offices um, and different people had different needs. And so we, we provided some structure to that, but we're pretty flexible on people, how people could use that. For our international colleagues, we also advanced some pay with concern that given the countries and context in which they work, bank could close. We needed to make sure that they were taken care of. We paused our annual performance process and have shifted to quarterly goal setting. We're calling quarterly sprints and thinking about our work in three month segments, which is more manageable. It's really hard to think a year in advance in a current crisis and, and really carving off um, some more manageable chunks. And I would say the biggest change we've made that's really had, I think, the most positive impact is that we implemented a four day work week and we did not reduce salaries when we did that. Our goal was really to build a culture of greater self care and identify greater efficiencies for short and long term. So we've maintained the four day work week also through the end of December. And that is something we'll also be assessing whether or not we can do that long term and will it look different if we do keep it that way. We then used pulse surveys with actually the support of leading edge to see how are these interventions we've put into place working. Are they working for people. How are people really doing um, and we actually found that staff felt a greater sense of transparency in really felt set up for success in many ways. 89% of people reported adjusting well to the new work from home. 76% reported feeling productive and 41% reported feeling more productive working from home than they had from the office. Um, over 95% reported internal communications had been informative and timely and 92% felt ready for extended work from home. 72% felt very prepared. The four day work week, when we pulled together a group of working parents, actually as kind of a, an affinity group to talk about their specific challenges, understanding especially as school was going back into session and this is going to be a much longer period of time in this posture. And the four day work week was really seen as a lifesaver for, for many of our working parents, but really all of our staff across the board. Um, so for us, you know, there's many things that have been working better, but we're trying to think about how do we keep it up? and how do we think of next steps for the future? So going to the next slide, yeah. Um, you know, balancing the immediate needs and the long-term planning. So we really tried to strike a balance between being prudent and being visionary, monitoring the short-term while still planning ahead. We froze hiring for several months and instead assessed needs and reallocated we had internally that wasn't fully utilized in our current state to support those areas that needed more resources. You know, some areas ended up with much less work as, as the way work changed and others really had a lot more on their plates as they were adjusting. Um, we focused a lot more on prioritization and what work is essential and will have the greatest impact. Instead of canceling, we, we were about to launch a leadership development program, which would have taken all of our directors, of whom we have about 24, um, and put them through a six month leadership development program. There were going to be in-person components and, and full day meetings. And instead, we really scaled that back. And, um, but we did decide to move ahead. We thought that that investment in our people and in our leaders would be essential to our success. And I would say it has been. We've been able to lean on our leaders and to build them up and to position them to help with messaging, to help support their people on their team. Um, and we've implemented a plan ahead team that has led our leadership team through scenario planning, resulting in clear scenarios that include internal and external triggers we can monitor should we have to change course at any point over the next 24 months. The new ways of working have really opened up our eyes to rethinking the workplace at AJWS. And as Amy said, a lot of the global workforce has been shifting anyway, but really we're seeing some of this as an opportunity um, to be innovative and to think differently about how we work and, and, and where we're working. And so we've laid some good groundwork. I think some of our upcoming challenges will be, you know, applying the practical and technical to the transformative and, and keeping an eye on that. But um, yeah, that's some of what AJWS has done and, um, and it's exciting to think about what's next. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. It is really inspiring for me to hear what you've been up to. Um, every time I hear it, I hear something different and, and think about the ways that it can be applied more broadly. So thank you for being a leader in that way. Um, and now I'm excited to turn it over to Randall um, so he can share some of his perspective on what he's been seeing and feeling in the field. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see us even bigger. 
Thank you, Amy uh, and, and uh, Corinne, both of you, uh, very insightful uh, presentations. Um, I'm going to take the approach of um, what I'm seeing, as, as Amy said, as a uh, board member and as a funder. Um, I am uh, blessed to be able to sit on several national Jewish boards, including Leading Edge, including Foundation for Jewish Camps. I'm the prior, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I am a prior uh, chairman of the board of Hillel, chairman of the board of uh, governors of Hillel, and I uh, am the uh, founding chair of uh, Hillel's Hillel U, which is focused on talent uh, management and development. Uh, if, if this were happening last February, I would have said it is extraordinary that the Jewish world is finally waking up and saying that the core of almost every Jewish organization is its people. We had become people focused, particularly in the big organizations and talent focused. Not every organization had sort of gotten their act completely together, but I think both as funders and as organizations, people were saying, you know, we've got to invest in our people, our talent management, our development in our leaders, our development in um, people in the field who and lower levels to uh, constantly be improving their um, their their uh, abilities and their talents so that they can be the future uh, leaders of the Jewish organizations. You know, then came COVID, so we're all focusing in the right direction. COVID hits, and what I'm really seeing is sort of this tension. I think most of the organization, uh, really all of the organizations I've been involved with, at the big level as well as I'm on a lot of local boards um, and camp boards. Um, everyone is trying to deal with the uh, human relations part of their businesses with grace and with uh, empathy. Uh, but the tension is, is that they're concerned about sustainability and viability. So, you know, and they are, uh, as Amy said, uh, they are furloughing people. There's been a lot of senior executives who have taken voluntary pay cuts. Um, they are trying to do things to uh, to do things in the in a Jewish way. Um, they're doing a lot of scenario planning for the big organizations. What I'm actually seeing with smaller organizations and local organizations is that they're so overwhelmed, they're not really doing a lot of scenario planning. What they're doing is praying that things will go back to normal, that they can make sure that their funders are going to keep them afloat until it does. And um, they're, they're probably not being as proactive as they could be, uh, but they're just so overwhelmed, um, uh, particularly at the CEO level, that they are just, because they're having to deal with a new reality, pivot their organizations, come up with new programs to service people, deal with the employee situation. So it's very hard for them to balance and do everything. They need our support. Um, nothing can be, would be more helpful than us as funders to continue to uh, give them the security that they need as to their funding for particularly the next two years. Because what I'm generally seeing from a financial point of view that many of these many organizations kind of have made it this far because they got PPP loans, they got emergency grants from many of us um, to make sure that they could stay afloat while they were figuring it out. But organizations are very nervous about what's going to happen if this continues, what's going to happen in 2021, particularly because some of them robbed Peter to pay Paul. They are dipping into uh, their found their their um, uh, uh, any kind of endowment funds, uh, which they should, frankly, because these are the kinds of crises endowment funds are given for. Um, and they're getting a lot of emergency grants from funders. But I've heard from several kinds of organizations that um, you know they're worried that if this continues that many federations, foundations are gonna be focusing maybe improperly so on the human side of the, of the crisis, you know, food banks, social services and things like that. And many of our Jewish organizations are afraid that they're gonna get substantial cutbacks next year 
in terms of grants. So to the extent that we as funders can give those that we support confidence for the next couple of years, that would be great. Uh, look, from my own personal perspective, I feel myself so incredibly blessed that the stock market and our funds and our foundations have grown, a little, actually grown in this period of time that I think that uh, to the extent that we can uh, keep a perspective of helping these organizations out and take one worry off their backs would be, is very important. Um, my personal opinion watching many of these organizations is that it will take a, a substantial period of time for them to bring people back. Um, they um, also are, for those people that are on board, many organizations are trying to continue to um, use this time for professional development. Um, they want to be able to keep the best and the brightest of those in their organization, but that is really going to take both proper talent management and sort of the perspective of those that are the best that could go out and get other jobs to, to feel like the future of the organization is strong going forward and that's where we can help. Um, I also think that there's many, many organizations out there, whether they're medium or small, and some are also large, that do not have talent managers and HR leaders like Corinne um, and Amy and others um, to really help them work through this crisis. And as Amy noted, um, and what I happen to see um, on the ground is that executives, uh, particularly the CEOs, are completely overwhelmed and sometimes the people side take a back seat, not because they're not concerned about it, but because there just isn't the time in the day to deal with it. So it's almost like the ship is taking on water and they're trying to figure out how to keep it afloat by and while, you know, we're asking them to not only keep it afloat, but the people that are bailing the water out behind them, their employees, sometimes they're, they're too focused, it, or not too focused, but they're very focused on how am I going to keep the organization, raise the money we need, um, keep the services going that we need to provide, et cetera. And so if, they, if people don't have HR directors who can really back them up, um, we need to be thinking about how we help them either through lay leaders providing help or providing funding to help them get some uh, either consulting um, HR people or um, contract HR people to help them get through this period of time. Um, I, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to highlight. Um, you know, I, I will say that for those of you, if you're concerned whether the boards um, are pitching in to help from a financial point of view, I have seen absolutely incredible contributions by boards and ex-board members to help these organizations financially. Uh, they're not sort of just turning to outside donors and foundations, but to the extent that we can help all of our Jewish organizations that we support feel secure financially, I think it will go a long way to help them also be able to then focus more on uh, retaining and growing their talent and the, and the people that they have, and even be able to bring some back uh, with more confidence. So Amy, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Randall. Um, we wanna open it up to questions from all of you. Um, so feel free to chat them to us. I have one to start us off, but feel free to chat them just to me or to the group and we'll, we'll moderate them from here. Um, Randall, you mentioned some tactical ways that funders have been particularly helpful. Um, I'm curious to hear from your perspective, are there other little or big things you've seen or, or heard that funders are doing to be helpful during this time? Yeah, I mean, you know, particularly uh, funders who are actively in got involved with certain organizations, there's been a lot of challenge granting, you know, sort of um, people knowing that they're 100,000 or 200 or 300,000 or $500,000 shy, 
you may have larger funders say, I'll tell you what, I'll put up a $100,000 challenge grant. That seems to work quite well. Um, I've seen people go back to groups of past chairs and uh, past board members and use them as kind of cohorts to say, the past chairs have just raised 100, will the current board match it? Um, I think everybody is, um, not everybody, but, but many people are digging deep. Um, so I've seen a lot of that. I also would encourage organizations, and, and here we're really speaking, those of us on this um, uh, Zoom are primarily funders. I would think about um, making uh, multi-year gifts. I, there's, there's a lot of organizations and, and, and also a lot of foundations, rightfully so, have said, I can make a multi-year gift right now because we don't know what things are going to look like. We want to keep our powder dry. Things could get worse in certain areas. We need to fund those, and I get that completely. To the extent that you're able to give some of these organizations confidence for more than kind of the, the next 12 months, it would really help them be able to plan and, and particularly on the people side of things. Lots of good points there, Randall. Thank you. Karen, do you have anything to add to that around what you've seen funders do that has been, have been particularly helpful or things you can imagine they might do that would be helpful? I think, I mean, AGWS is also a, a funder. We give to our partners. Um, and I think some of the approaches Randall mentioned are things we've considered from that perspective. I think also unrestricted gifts so that we can, you know, think about how to best use the money in this time of crisis is important. Um, you know, there, there might be demands that are new and, and things that aren't necessarily the, the super exciting things to fund, but are really necessary to keep organizations going. Um, the question is, is uh, really well framed. So cognizant that funders are not, not all funders are board members or staff members and they should not be driving strategy or policy. Um, at the same time, what can funders do to help support the people side of an organization, mental health, staff care, et cetera? How can funders be helpful without overstepping? Um, I have some thoughts, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, Randall, do you have thoughts on this one first? Well, as, as a, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts too, but as a, as a board member, I think that, and as a funder, I think the thing that we can help people with is um, help the, the senior executives think through things, um, challenge them to, to, to know whether they're able to be thinking about um, their uh, talent management policies and strategies right now, or are they too overwhelmed, and maybe help them get the, the uh, help they need. Um, also, some of us, because we're involved with many organizations, see best practices that are going on and um, it may be that, that you can you know, help by advising the CEO of what others are doing or potentially connecting them to, to someone in another organization like Corinne to say you know, something, why don't, you, why don't you give Corinne at AJWS a call? She's, she seems to be, um, have worked through some of these things. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say, especially in the early months, the shared resources was so helpful. Understanding what other people were doing, who had more information about um, the, the loans and how were people thinking about um, engaging with donors? How do you do that now virtually in a totally different way when a lot of things were, were done in person? Um, how are you taking care of your people? Sharing things, we've had, I think a few of our board members have shared free resources for say, um, guided meditations or other things that can support both mental and physical health, which has been helpful to be able to say, here's some free resources to our staff um, and making those connections and also sharing best practices. You know, in some ways we're all kind of catching up here. This, <laughs> I mean, I don't think anyone was ready for a global pandemic to hit and what that would mean in terms of changes to how we work. And so where we can, can share and really come together as a community to support one another, that's been invaluable, really. Um, and just being able to talk to people. I mean, I will also say from an HR and talent management perspective, understanding we're not alone in some of this and we're working through it together. 
does bring a little bit of, of solace and hope too that, okay, we are all in this and we will figure this out. Um, but those are some of the things and really those shared resources. We early on created a, a very long shared resources document um, that had everything from really true safety and security things, health matters, um, employee and staff engagement, policy development, it, it had everything in there because there was such an influx of information. And so being able to have that and share that and help sort through it with people, I found incredibly helpful. Great. Um, what I'll add is um, as a funder, um, you obviously carry some power and the questions that you ask um, can help direct leaders to think about things that, that might not be of forefront in their minds. So when funders are asking questions about how are your employees doing, how do you know how they're doing, uh, what are your needs around supporting your employees, just spotlighting and bringing some attention to that at that level coming from a funder can actually do a lot um, at an organization. Um, and the other thing that I've seen and heard funders do um, is Honestly, just check in with people. Uh, just check in with the leader or whoever your contact is at the organization because people at this time, um, it goes a long way for people to know that, that you care not only about the outcomes but also about how everyone is doing along the way towards those outcomes. I have another uh, just question. This is not something that's new to any of you, uh, being people-centered. Randall, you spoke about it. This is leading edges mission of, of helping with that and Corinne that's what you your your job is day in and day out um, is there a piece of that what you did before and being prepared from before and that it was front of mind as a funder and as a professional that has really helped helped in this in this pandemic because I often feel like if you weren't there the day before you can't be there the next day um, that can help people as they think about planning in the future and many different aspects of their, of their funding. Yeah, I can start with this one. The organizations who have elevated the role of someone who focuses on the people have been better able to move forward because they already had that built-in relation, that this, this most senior team was already thinking about this component of how they function. Um, so that was some of the groundwork that, that I think set AJWS, for example, up for great success. Yeah, I would agree. We went through a strategic planning process um, and have been kind of implementing that strategic plan over the past two years. And so knowing what our top objectives and priorities were helped with prioritization. So, you know, we to try to prevent us from spreading ourselves too thin and staying focused um, and really being able to emphasize our, our two lines of business. And, and our people-centered centered approach is not new to this. We've been able to rework it. Um, but we have models built out where really people are at the center and that's not only just our staff. When we think of people at the center for us, it's our partners in the field, it's our donors, it's, it is our staff also, it is all of the people and how from there that informs the decisions that we're making and the work that we're doing. And so all of that really I think did help us already kind of have a, a step up um, in that way of thinking. From a donor point of view, I would say that, um, you know, there's not a lot that you could be prepared for um, aside from knowing the org well the organizations you're working with. What I would say is that I think this whole thing has, at least for many of the other philanthropists I talk to, has really, uh, you know, re-emphasized to us how blessed we are and that, um, you know, whether it's a foundation that's run professionally or whether it is driven by an individual or whether it's just an individual giving. I think many people that I talk to understand the need to step up bigger, that this is, this is a time that, you know, we count our blessings and we know we have to help and, and keep these Jewish organizations sustained at this time. And I would just encourage everyone to do that. Thank you. That actually goes very well to the next question that came in about thinking bigger and, better and different things is um, Amy projected about the longer term mental health issues that will emerge for staff raises a question about how best to help staff cope. Should the field consider funding special services that bring, bring employees together or is it best to recommend that they access services privately? 
think that's very interesting. I think it was Golly Cooks of Leading Edge that told me that there's other other times that it was like a CFO, CEO type of issue and crisis. And now it's like a HR or pe pe like head people person and CEO that it's a much more it could it's much more personal in certain ways this crisis and so this mental health issue um is a is a is a real question so what what would you all suggest on this i tend to think with something like mental health that it is a personal decision and how you choose to engage and get the support you need varies based on you and your lived experiences um we this actually goes back maybe a little bit to the last question you asked uh, we implemented a new EAP and EARP, so an Employee Assistance Program and Employee Assistance Resilience Program for both our international and our domestic staff. And a lot of the resources we've been able to share around this were from there. Um, and, and we've actually asked them about expanding some of their resources, given many of the things that have occurred over the past six months, to think a little more, more broadly. Um, but that has been something that staff have been utilized. We're examining our utilization reports to see how much, but obviously in a way that's protecting employee privacy too. Um, and I mean, again, internally as a group, we've thought about when are we bringing everyone together and, and when is it best not to, and to check in with people on an individual basis and trying to strike that balance at various points um, and, and leading, again, having our decision-making be led by those that are most impacted by whatever it is that's going on in a given moment. I really appreciate this question. I'll share that over the years at Leading Edge, we have gotten questions about um, pooling health care and you know, pooling other things together from how can we use the power and the strength of the sector as a whole to get services in different ways. Um, it hasn't happened in a dramatic way um, or quite like what you're suggesting. Um, but I think it's interesting for communities to think about uh, if there is a community-wide approach or if there's a subsector wide approach, meaning like JCCs, day schools, like subsectors, or, or what could make sense. I think it's a really, um, a really interesting way to think about how we can prepare for what's to come. Um, and I also want to mention um, that our partners at JPRO have been doing some work where they're pulling people from different organizations together, specifically those who are newly unemployed and supporting them um, in that way. So it may be a model that we can look at and think about as we think about how else we can serve the field in a broader way. I'm um, in our last few minutes here. I don't know if, if um, Amy, if you had some final thoughts or Corinne or Randall wanted to, to give, you know, a, a few words of uh, to, to end to end and to, to give people some hope and inspiration about what we could do next with uh, with with the group that we with the group that we have here in the Jewish communal force and how we can continue to help support I would say one of the headlines I'm walking away with was what you said Amy that if we don't invest in our people now we might not have people to invest in and I thought there was a clear theme in what Randall you were saying as well and, and the approach we've taken of how important that is right now um, and how unprecedented this, this all is and how it's impacting people personally and professionally. And I really think, as you put it, it, it just captured perfectly um, and, and where we can do that and where it's possible for organizations to do that, that that is the way to lead and to move forward. That is a fantastic headline to, to end with, I think, yeah, for sure. It really sums up why this is important and why we want to bring everybody together to have these kind of conversations and to understand the work that's being done and to understand the, the funder's perspective of why they've been passionate about this for years and understand the data that's that we're learning and so that we can continue to support so that we have we have the we have the sector strong and available. Um, so wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Amy, Randall, Corinne, thank you so much for all of your wisdom and sharing your time with us. And thank you to all the participants who were here today for, for being here and caring about this issue. And we hope to continue learning together and, and, um, and doing what we can to support the many different pieces of, of the sector that, that need our support right now. So Shana Tova to everybody and looking forward to learning with you all in the future. Thank you so much.